and welcome, ladies and gentlemen, to the monastery, the open bar. Place where we, the good brothers and sisters of this most holy of temples, seek enlightenment through the drunkest, craziest, and most batshit ways possible. I am your one and only gaming monk, better known as Mildra, and with me I have a returning good brother to the temple, previously known for injuries and vile deeds, now coming back with the Tome of Intangible Treasures from Lone Colossus Games, the one and only Josh, don't call him Mark Rosing. How you doing today, man? And right on cue, Discord decided to be Discord. Sorry about that. There we go. Yeah. Um, yeah, just you. God damn! God damn it! One one little bit of technology issue, and my whole and my whole flow gets thrown off. So it's been it's been quite it's been quite a while since I had you on last. I think that was about two years ago. Yep. Um, and now you're now you're back with Tome of Intangible Treasures. Um, yeah. How have you how have you been holding up in the in that um, span of time? Oh, pretty good. Um, finished grad school and started you know, full-time job and stuff, so it's always nice having some money. <laughs> so, with Tome of Intangible Treasures, was this, some, was, was this something that you had conjured up while working on Injuries and Vile Deeds? What was the origin story of this? Yeah, so um, it kind of has a couple of origin points. Um, the first of them was um, when I was starting a new 5e campaign. Um, I was doing something different with character creation. And one of the things that I added was, since we were starting at level 5, I didn't feel like backgrounds um, kind of covered... Uh, you know, they, they usually, I view them as covering up to level 1. So starting at level five, well, what did you do from level one to level five? So that was where I got the idea of histories from that are going to be in the book. Mm -hmm. So they're kind of like backgrounds, but they represent the actual adventures that you've had once you've had class levels, right? So like if you were a sailor at level zero and then you went off and you traveled to the plane of water, maybe the sailing skills are still useful there, but also you might have you know acquired some new skills in that time. Um, and so the histories sort of build on your adventures. They act as, they, you know, they, they, they give you some background-like mechanical bonuses for your adventures so far. So that's kind of one thing that I, I had. And then the other um, kind of component that started bringing me toward the idea of intangible treasures um, was uh, the advanced trainings in the book. So those are inspired by prestige classes from 3.5. Mm -hmm. And those are a thing that I just really enjoy from a player standpoint and from a designer standpoint. And while I don't think like prestige classes as classes in 5e make much sense, um, I wanted some way of like capturing that feel of like, well, I did this specific multi-class to get this specific flavor. And then like, this is going to sort of tie it together and blend those classes better. Um, and so that's where the advanced trainings came from. And sort of from that, I was like, all right, well, so I've got these sort of non-physical things, but the, the um, advanced trainings are kind of maybe a little bit like magic items or like a class special class feature. Um, so where can I go from there? And then I just had this idea, um, I think probably inspired in some ways by playing a lot of Spirit Island, the board game, if you're familiar with that. Um, mm -hmm. And like, you get to do all of these fun things as spirits in that game. And so I was like, okay, well, what you know, what would you get? Like, I love all of the flavorful names of the powers and stuff. And so I started thinking of, okay, so you have like, you know, blessing of the wind and rain and, you know, um, you know, boon of corruption or v various things like that. And so the whole book sort of formed into this, well, we've got tons of magic items. There's lots and lots of magic item compendiums out there. Um, how about an expansion of non-magic item you know, magic item type rewards. So boons and blessings are very similar to magic items, but they're locked into a specific person. Um, and that sort of expanded out from there into the charms and the packs that you have in the book as well. 
Mm-hmm. And we'll we'll get we'll be getting into those. And I do I do think it's interesting you bring up pr prestige classes because that that reminds me of something that was my whipping boy back in my 3.0 and 3.5 days, and that being the prerequisite issue. Um, how how certain prestige classes and certain feats had a level of prerequisite that was a little bit excessive. Sure. Um, yeah. Uh, that that in the whole, you're still dealing with only tw with only twenty levels. I mm -hmm. know that some people say that prestige classes became subclasses in five e. I don't see it. Because, yeah. Because, okay. Uh. Well, let me let me rephrase that. I see it with some classes where right. your subclass is meant to supplement what that class can do. Right. Um, yep. Fighter is a good example of that. But yeah. for classes where you, where a good amount of your kit is going to come from your subclass, mm -hmm. um, a lot of the casting classes are would fit this, like, say, Warlock, sor Sorcerer, um, Wizard, that, and so on. And definitely Not... cleric, right? Because that's your domain. That's yeah. the core part of your class. Yeah. And tr truth be told, that whole half in half out thing is has been an it has been something of an issue. But that's another matter. Um, the the thing of the thing about the thing about prestige classes, I've always felt, is that they should be a more spe a more specialized trade off versus a more general approach that a class has. Um, you know, it's the it's the equivalent of some of someone going from being from being a general good with weapons kind of fighter to specializing in a particular fighting style. Yeah. Just as an just as an example, um, I think Ghostfire had had a nice idea with it with the class mods. I'm not sure if they invented that concept. That was the first time I saw it through through like the Grim Hollow um, series. I don't think I'm. I've heard of Grim Hollow. I'm not familiar with but, the class mods, though. But that's that's something that's meant to develop in parallel. That that isn't even using experience to level up. Ah, uh, okay. So doesn't doesn't quite hit the sweet spot. And with the, with that in with with that in mind, I'm I'm fairly certain <laughs> that your equivalent, whether it be whether it be boons or or otherwise, you're not do you're not. Um, going that far with prerequisites. Yeah, the prerequisites are pretty simple. Um, so in terms of... So the advanced trainings have a prerequisite, um, and it's always going to be five class levels. Um, generally, so there, there's going to be one advanced training per class, sort of like what is the monkiest monk that you could have, right? The roguiest rogue. Um you know, really like diving into what makes this class this class and then making it just a little bit better at that thing. Um, because I wanted to have something available for people to choose if they were not going to multi-class. But for everyone who likes multi-classing, especially if you like doing weird things, like, I don't know, Cleric Bard, where you're not casting off the same stat, um, I wanted to have ways for you to tie those classes together and make them really actually work well in 5e and not just be like, oh, well, why did you make that choice? Um <laughs> Uh, so the the prerequisites are partly you you need to have be a less at least a fifth level character, um, but then also uh, usually it requires two levels in one of the classes and three levels in the other one. And I don't think there are any. I'll probably say this and I'll be wrong. There might be a couple that are like specifically must be two levels in this one, three levels in the, the other one, and that would just be because most classes whatever that like special class features that I'm building on in them comes at level two or level three. Mm -hmm. Some of them get that at level one, but like most classes you need at least two or three levels to really get the core part of the class that I'm building on. And so I have that prerequisite to say like, all right, well, I mean, referencing this feature, so you better have it before you take it. <laughs> if anything, look, looking through what you have planned, the thing that I keep being, being reminded of is the alternative rewards setup that was that was introduced in the DM's Guide 2 for D&D 4th Edition. And I, I can hear some people in the, in the distance screaming at me for, bring, for bringing up 4th. Look, I, call, I will continue to call that game the edition I'm supposed to hate, but don't because I'm not getting paid. It's, 
<laughs> you know, I I I really love low level 4E. Um the, my only issue with it myself, the only the only reason that I really really like 5E is the closed math, like you know, the limited um what do they call it? You know what I'm talking about, where you know, the numbers only go up so far, right? And like, to me as a game master, that means that I can take some really hard, you know, high CR creature and throw it at the party. And yeah, they're not going to try and, you know, hopefully they try and run away, but they have a chance of running away. In like 4E or like Pathfinder 2nd Edition, as much as I love it for other reasons, um, you have this issue of all the numbers scale continuously with your level. And if you're fighting something that's more than a couple levels higher than you, you can't run away from it, and it always hits you. You're gonna die. <laughs> um, but yeah, for, yeah, fourth edition had some um, some pretty cool stuff yeah. in it, and 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 that like because it required magic items for your numbers to work, them adding in that option for you to you know kind of sidestep that requirement was really nice to have as well. Yeah, and the now when it when. Now with um bo- with, with boons and blessings you ha- you've you've brought th- you've brought that up when it comes when it comes to the when it comes to those two what is the dividing line between say a boon or a blessing or are they meant is it a term that's meant to be interchangeable Yeah um they're they're flavorly you know fl- flavor wise are different um but uh from a mechanical standpoint they're identical which is why I group them together like that um i just felt like there were some things that were felt better to be named as a blessing or just like kind of mechanical flavor wise felt more like a blessing than a boon um but yeah from a from a mechanic standpoint they're identical i'd say it i'd say it works better as as far as the whole this is this is where the co- this is what the cosmos thinks of you more than say alignment but i might be biased because i've never been a fan of the of what alignment ended up becoming yeah, five E doesn't really touch alignment much. <laughs> well, this isn't a, this isn't a five E specific problem. This is a problem that evolved as D as D and D evolved over the years. The r- alignment originally was heavily rooted in the whole law and whole law and chaos dichotomy from the from the Eternal Champion books. You know, from especially from the Elric trilogy. Um, sure. And it was meant to be this is this is how the this is how the cosmic forces look at you. Since in a lot of the Eternal Champion books there is pantheons for law and chaos, neither of them are good. Law is authoritarian, chaos is well chaos. Right, yeah. Uh, over time and I I can't say when this happened. But it ended up morphing into a morality system, and it was never really designed with that kind of thing in mind. And tr- and truth be told, trying to do those sort of binary moralities ends up creating arguments. If you if I have to if I have to use a non non tabletop example of how this creates arguments, look at the whole what is a paragon and renegade action in Mass Effect. Yeah, there's. For for the mo ninety percent of the time it's on point, but there's those ten percents that leave you with head scratching <laughs> um, cases, especially with how morally gray a lot of the actions in those games can be. Mm-hmm. Uh, whereas, whereas I've always I've a lot of times I've dropped the alignment setup and instead gone for an affiliation. Either with factions or with um, pantheons or the like. I.e., yeah, these guys, these guys like you. These guys don't care about you. These guys will shoot at you. Will shoot on you on sight. These guys will shoot at you twice. <laughs> yeah, I do kind of like. So the I still play in a three point five game. Mm-hmm. Um, it's been going on for a long time. Um, but one of the things that I do really like about it is that we do relative alignments, and that there is a certain amount of there are certain things that are like you know cosmically aligned right um but then there's also the like you know when you cast a spell that requires a certain alignment 
of your enemy. It is based on the differences in your beliefs with you and them. So it requires you to know who you are as a character and for the GM to know who you are as a character. And then like, sometimes you don't know who your allies are necessarily as characters. And so sometimes when we cast a spell, <laughs> then someone else in the party goes, oh yeah, I'm pretty sure we're like morally opposed to each other actually. So that's going to affect me too. So that, that has brought some, uh, some fun interactions, but I, I can see like really good reasons to use either like, you know, cos cosmically aligned and then like, you know, individually aligned, uh, yeah. alignments but it's definitely a lot more work to do it individually aligned mm -hmm. um and when when it comes to the concept of ch of charms um you in the preview it's mentioned that charms are similar to bo to similar to boons but more limited um yeah what's what would you say is the dividing line between boons and charms Sure. So to give like a, a magic item comparison, charms are like the consumables of boons and blessings, um, but they're also limited in uh, duration. So generally, I'm, and I'm going to provide some um, guidance on if you don't want this to be the case, but generally speaking, they all have to be used within two weeks, or it might be like a short term, you know, mi minor bonus that lasts for two weeks. So the reasoning behind that is we all hoard consumables. You give people like a potion of fly or, you know, potion of invisibility. We're going to hang on to that until the end of the campaign. You know, we're never going to use it. So if, if I put a time limit of you have to use this in two weeks uh, on the charms, then now you have a reason to use it. Um, and that's actually something that's, I think, at least some of, if not all of the charms that are in the Dungeon Master's Guide do is they have that sort of short term limitation on them. Hmm. Um, and I I like that, so I kept it. Yeah, I can I can certainly get that. Now, when it, now when it comes to pacts, that I that kind of thing I find in, I find interesting. Since let's consider the warlock for a moment. The whole mm -hmm. idea with the warlock is they make a deal with the devil or with or with the fey or with angels or something some sort of deal in order to get their magic. That's how they're supposed to work. Right. But that doesn't quite manifest in how, in how most warlocks play, and because of that, they end up being played as um, blaster casters, for instance. Yeah. Is the pack, was the pack your way of kind of addressing that? Um... Not initially. Um, they're not... Because they're not like tied to warlocks yeah, specifically, not in right? In terms of tied but, with warlocks, but that that theme of deal with the devil that has an upside and a downside. Yeah, yeah, they're definitely like, and I don't know, you know, it, it'll d definitely take some like testing hmm. um, to see if I've gotten the costs balanced well. Um, because I, at least my the groups that I've played with, no one ever wants to take my my bargains for power <laughs> i offer them power and there's some cost associated with it and they're like i'm too smart for this i know how this goes in stories i won't you know i'm not gonna accept this yeah that's um, the problem. So i want to make sure that there's enough power in there that people are at least you know still tempted to take them um and you know some of the the pacts could be still a reward it could be oh you have done enough of a service to me that i will consider that the cost for your mm -hmm. pact and so some of the, the packs, especially some of the Fey packs, um, do have that as a requirement. So there's a summer night and winter night pact, for example, um, where you have to, you know, prove your loyalty to that court, that Fey court. And so in in so doing, you are tying yourself to that court, right? So that is sort of the cost: is yeah, you are aligned yourself with the summer court or the winter court. Um, but like, you know, you you ha you either have to do that before you you know you can enter the pact and once you have completed your quest then you will get the the benefits of it or it might be you have done enough stuff that we are willing to offer you this pact uh essentially free of charge other than you are now aligned with us um but yeah i think i want to say the first pact was actually inspired by um a spell or two from 3.5 as well there are a couple of spells where you actually spend some experience and you cast it and then it's like you set a trigger of, you know, when this thing happens, I get this, like, you know, massive boost to my abilities 
for like a minute or two. So it's like, oh, I'm about to die. Okay, I'm going to make sure that I get through this combat. Um, but it costs you something to do it. Mm -hmm. That that certainly makes that certainly makes <clears throat> sense. And I know I use the phrase "deal with the devil," but that's just that's just a corollary. Um, and of course, getting people to getting people to accept it is a bit tricky when you have a table that's full of people who are on some level genre savvy. Yeah. Um, and. In that same vein, is is history's your attempt at expanding um, backgrounds? Because yeah, I think you said earlier that backgrounds feel like they lose their they they lose their impact after the first few levels. They lose their impact a little bit, um, but also I think from a flavor perspective, right? Like it's supposed to be what you did up until level one. So especially when you're creating higher level characters, I wanted that, you know, I wanted to have something to encourage people to continue what they were doing, you know, continue expanding their backstory a little bit, you know, beyond level one, or at least to consider that, hey, like, it's not like you were a sailor and you gained 10 levels as a sailor. Maybe it, maybe that's true, but if that's true, then you're a really good sailor, right? Like, you spent 10 levels of your career as a sailor, you should have something more to represent that. So um, some of the backgrounds, like sailor, like soldier, uh, where their their feature that they have is, you know, uh, amenable to this, um, then I would say you can take that, and I have some guidelines for uh, turning backgrounds into histories. Uh, so you could take those backgrounds and then add additional, you know, ranks of them essentially as history. So that's one thing that histories have is you can take them multiple times. Every time you do, the feature that they grant you gets a bit better. So if you're a soldier, for example, uh, you might start out as a low rank soldier at level one, right? That's your background is you were a soldier. You're just a regular soldier. At level five, you kept being a soldier during that time. You probably have some kind of rank, right? And then as you get more and more um, ranks of the history, then your uh, rank as a soldier, for example, could increase. Because I do, I do remember talking about the backgrounds thing in when it comes to van, vanilla five E, and stating that the mechanical impact with them is some is somewhat gimped in this in the sense that um, it don't that it's the weight that it's going to have is very um, specific. Yeah, so, the the features that they offer are sometimes sometimes it seems like they rarely ever come up in in a campaign right yeah and i know i know that the argument can be made for inspiration but inspiration is so broad that yeah that the amount of the amount of impact that it can have is is equally is when it's and that, that's when more it's of a did i remember to give out inspiration versus a well i have this feature it just we literally never came upon the niche use for it, um, and so it didn't use it. Yeah. Uh, now, when it comes to titles, I think th I did note that some um, some of them have some. I think I think a fair amount of them have some mechanical benefit. But when I see this concept of a title that you can have that has that kind of benefit, the thing that instantly comes to mind is the title system that's been in the Tales of series. You know what? That's uh, I, I hadn't thought of that before, but that is a pretty good uh, comparison. Um, I titles kind of came from this like, so I've played a lot of uh, Final Fantasy fourteen, mm. and like you have you can get titles right, and you can choose what title you're walking around with. They don't do anything in the game, but they're kind of cool. Um, and so I was like, well, what if what if we had those, but like they actually did something in five e? You know, like y you do all these cool things, like you should probably have some titles if you're walking around as a seventh level adventure, right? You've probably done something, you know, name worthy. Um, and a lot of us also just like give our characters titles already. It's like, well, why did you earn that title? You know, what did you do? Let's, let's have that story. And then now maybe you actually have this title and then let's see what that does for you. Um, so yeah, a lot of them, they have mechanical effects. Most of them are sort of non-combat, um, more social or exploration oriented. Um, I think some of them probably do have combat effects, but um, 
Yep. Yeah, they're um, they're definitely intended to expand the the other pillars more than the the combat pillar. And I've I have a fondness for um, not only giving characters titles, but get but um, depend as they get a cert a good amount of achievements, giving them a lot of titles. You know, to much in the same way that say Ottoman kings had long, long, long yes names or. The ultimate example of that is in the Warhammer universe, Cetra the Imperishable, who's who at, whose title who if you try to read off all of his titles, it would be about two hours in length. Yes. Um, if you here's the and un, unfortunately, I un, unfortunately I couldn't I can't do the copy pasta for it, so I'm just going to use the image ver, the image version. Because the because of the damn character limit, <laughs> but just look at all that. Wow. <laughs> and he and Cetra is very full of himself, so he insists on having them read out properly. Whenever he whenever he makes a fi an official appearance, which is both legendarily arrogant, and also <laughs> a very also quite the flex. I love the end of this. It's just end many, many more. <laughs> <laughs> like I said, he has his. Yeah, I can't be bothered to read the whole thing, but I hope that was enough to satisfy you. Let's get going. Ima imagine, <laughs> be, imagine being the herald having to read all of that off. Uh, yeah, and you'd have to keep reading it off because even you know, no matter how many times you've read it, you're not going to have it fully memorized. Mm -hmm. You know, it's the same way that there's some town names in the real world that have ridiculously long names. Everybody knows about that one town in, in Wales that's that's a short mm -hmm. paragraph worth of a name, or the one in New Zealand that may as well be a short story of a name. Yep. Uh, and neither one I'm going to try and pronounce because I guarantee you I'm going to butcher it. Uh, but... I'm gu I'm guessing that with with the full list of titles when you when you do that each of them will have some degree of a um, mechanical benefit. Um. Y yes. So every every title is going to have some kind of mechanical benefit. Um. And then yeah, and then they they have some uh, some similar re you know related titles suggested for each one um and so that sort of allows you to uh potentially swap some out there might be titles that use um a title that is in a similar title <laughs> for another t uh, title um so like i might have you know the tactician could be one title but i might also have uh like the strategist and come up with a different you know benefit for that one um just because there are going to be a lot of them. Um, <clears throat> and I might think of ways to, to provide, you know, different rewards for similar things. Um, but I think, you know, they're all, the titles are intended to be suggestions of here's how you could design titles here is how you could use them because there's really a limitless number of titles that you could have. Um, and so I try to provide enough context for DMs to like make up their own titles and for their own games. And I'm ge I'm guessing. Do you have plans on putting in a bit of advice for what sort of deeds or the like might warrant um, the tit some of the titles? Yeah, um, yeah, for sure. So like, you know, and I think it depends on the on the DM too. But I feel like um, anytime you've done something major and noteworthy, um, you'll probably earn a title for it. It's up to your group if you want to do like you know one person gets the title or multiple people people get the title. I kind of feel like um, you know it it would be best if it was on like one person, you know. Um, but sometimes the whole group should be known for something, right? Like if you as a group saved a town, then you should all be the heroes of that town, right? Um, and the power level of the title for some of these, like you know, saviors of the town of Wendleton, right? How useful is that? Well, it only matters for people who care about that town. So if it's a town of 50 people and there are 200 people in the world that care about that, 
great, you have a thing that helps you for 200 people in the world. And maybe, you know, it, it'll help you in some other small town where they've heard of that town. And you're like, hey, we helped them. And they're like, oh, we heard of you. You know, you, you're, you're the saviors of Wendleton, right? Um, so, you know, it could expand as long as people know who you are. And so that's the other kind of part of a lot of these titles is, um, you know, people have to know that you have that title for it to work. Mm -hmm. Which is cer is certainly the ca is certainly the case. I mean, if you're a if you're a local hero, if you're a folk hero, that's not going to matter as much if you're not in the that particular town or township. Right. As opposed to somebody who has some sort of defender of the realm kind of title which is going to have a wider influence, but if you're dealing mm -hmm. but if you're dealing with peasants, they're not going to care. You know, it's it's that sort of that sort of balancing act. Right. Uh, and when it comes now when it comes to advanced when it comes to advanced trainings which which I believe is what you had mentioned before that's going to be the equivalent of prestige classes. Mm -hmm. But it look but it but as I understand it each of them is not is only going to be granting one particular but one particular benefit, right? Uh, as as opposed to a prestige class, which is granting multiple benefits as you level. Right. Yeah. So it's not um, it's not giving like the equivalent of multiple class levels, um, but it's intended to kind of take your two classes that you have for if you're a multi-classing character. Um, and make those really work together. So, for example, the Arcane Assassin, um, you know, you have to be a sorcerer, a wizard, and a rogue, um, and it lets you, you know, blend your uh, spells and sneak attack <clears throat> features, because normally you don't get sneak attack unless you're using a finesse weapon, right? Um, and so, uh, you know, being able to sneak attack with spells is very powerful, then, you know, you need to keep up your training you have to uh you know maintain that balance of how much mage you are and how much rogue you are um but yeah i didn't want to like create full classes that would require you to put levels into them mm -hmm. um yeah. i'd like i'd like to play a little bit of an association game i'm going to name one of the base classes and you you can tell me if if you have a a advanced training that would fit that particular class. Okay. Barbarian. Oh, I'm trying to remember the name. I have an advanced training for every class. I just need to remember what they all are. <laughs> uh, barbarian. I have... So long. Uh, yeah, I mean, Master of Theory is my barbarian only. All right. Um, yeah. Um, bard. Singer of the Divine. It's a bard cleric or bard paladin. Mm -hmm. Kind of reminds me of the cantor. Mm hmm. Um, cleric. Uh, uh, Master of the Mystic Arcanum. Although it's it sound it does sound like a few, a few entry a few entries aren't class specific but, um, specific towards a certain archetype. Mm -hmm. Yeah, there's a. We got at least one that is keyed toward spellcasters in general. I don't remember if I've finished fleshing that one out or not, but for the most part they are um, uh, multi-class specific. Mm -hmm. um, druid, or druid for those who are men of culture. Uh, Fist of the Wilds. So a, dru so a druid monk. Yep. Which, all that, pr that prompts is I'm the Lorax. I speak for the trees. 
And the trees <laughs> say to fuck off. <laughs> oh. Fighter. I'd imagine there's quite a f there's quite a few potential candidates for fighter. Yeah, um, I'm gonna go master of martial forms. Stance dancer. Uh, it's yeah, it's well, it's monk fighter. Um, so it right now it's not not a final version, and I need to update it because I think what I came up for it with it was uh not on par with the other ones. So that one's getting revised, but I like the name, so keeping that oh. one. Monk. Enlightened one. Mm -hmm. So is, would that be a case of a monk who's dipping into a bit of a bit of cleric? Uh that is the, the monk the pure monk. The monkiest monk. Why do I feel called out? <laughs> oh. I'll just God. call it Mildred. <laughs> If you end up doing that, I will <laughs> die laughing. Um, the Paladin. Righteous Assassin. Altair, is that you? <laughs> kind of. It's a sneak attack, divine smite combo. So I wasn't. So in that. In. <laughs> yeah. Uh, Wild Warden. So Wild Warden is a Paladin Ranger, um, and it boosts your Divine Smite against your favorite enemies. Um, so I wanted to lean into all of the, well, Maybe not all of them, but a lot of the ranger um, options lean into the uh, favored enemy or favored terrain aspects of that class because I feel like they don't get enough love. <laughs> they're uh, they're very yeah. You know more about this thing, but you're not actually better at fighting them. So I wanted you to be better at fighting them. Mm hmm. Yeah, oh yeah, it I think they improved I think 4E Ranger was pretty good actually, but 3.5 was um awful. Yeah. Mm. Right. Yeah. I try tried to build one of those once and it did not work. <laughs> Yeah. <laughs> yeah. 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 Ranger was uh, the most um, voted for class in a, a poll that I ran asking which class deserves more love. It got 33% of the vote. So that was definitely a, a focus of mine lately.
Oh yeah. Yeah. I, I do not think that Rangers should have casting. Um, I feel like every time they add casting to Rangers, Rangers get worse because you have to balance against being a spellcaster. But most people playing a ranger don't necessarily want to cast spells. You're playing a ranger because you want to be a ranger. Um, you know, like cantrips, uh, you know, minor spells are one thing, but um, yeah. They do get some of the coolest spells in 5e, though. <laughs> There's some really awesome. Yeah, but the ranger only spells, I feel like, are some of the best spells in the game. It's just that you have to sacrifice so much else to get them that it's not usually worth it. Hmm. I can see that. Back on the rails. The Oh, okay. Well, my roguiest rogue one is Perfect Ghost, which is also inspired by a 3.5 prestige class, but that one's an epic level prestige class, so I kind of made it, um, you know, a normal type of ability instead of literally you turn into a ghost. <laughs> well, we already we already said one of those already, uh, which was the Master of the Mystic Arcanum. That's a sorcerer cleric. Um, but my favorite is the sorcerer wizard ultimate magus. Which is a very different thing, yeah. Yeah. Uh, Deific and Boker. Another uh, 4E call out for you. <laughs> <laughs> um, Archmage. Yep. Yeah, so the Archmage is a master of all eight schools. Um, so this actually, this is the only one that doesn't have a class level requirement. You have to be a wizard who knows at least three spells from each of the eight schools. So generally speaking, you're probably going to be at least level 5, but you can buy your way into that. Um, it makes you a generalist, essentially. Um, so all spells are going to be half as much to add to your spellbook. Um, and then, yeah, you get some extra spells prepared per, uh, per school, um, and you get one of those at each uh, spell level. So it basically makes you more flexible during the day. You 
passages that get picked. I think I think the I think the big reason is the selling point of being able to use more spells isn't Yeah, I mean uh I think pure wizards are already incredibly powerful, right? Because you get ninth level wizard spells uh, eventually. Um, but also, like, the ability to have more spells prepared is already kind of the wizard thing, right? So you are the most prepared person. You're the most prepared spellcaster out there. Um, and the ability to add any spell at half cost um, instead of just your chosen school, um, I think, makes it so that you can be prepared for literally anything. Yeah, so there's uh, so for example, Deific Invoker um, requires two levels in Cleric or three levels in Paladin plus three levels in Warlock, um, and the reason for that is you need Channel Divinity, and Paladin doesn't get it to level three. But the Channel Divinity part is the important part, so you can be either Cleric or Paladin um, for the, from the Divine side. And actually, that the other stipulation on that one is that your warlock patron and the source for your divine spell casting have to be the same being. Yeah, um, I would definitely consider it for uh, the advanced trainings. Um, I know there's something I would love to make more of, and I, there are 144 possible options, so there's no way I'm going to get all of those in the book. Um, but uh, for Boons and Blessings, I mean, they're very similar in design to magic items. The main difference is being that uh, they don't deal with attunement because the the reason you have attunement is it solves the issue of what if we pass this magic item back and forth constantly. Um, and you can't pass Boons and Blessings back and forth, and they have no material value because they're locked on you as a character. Um, so, you know, there's a, maybe a little bit of balance consideration there where you can have technically an unlimited number of these, but also it is 100% in the DM's hands whether you get this or not because you have to get it from something else as a reward for what you've done. So you have to have done something to earn it. Uh, whereas magic items, you could steal them, you can just buy them if, you know, your DM is saying that they're on open market, right? Um, yeah. Yeah, I'm definitely aiming for around, like, 250 pages, kind of your standard book size. Um, Obviously, stretch goals are going to expand that. Uh, we've already hit like three of them, so um, it's it's getting bigger. Um, but I'm, yeah, I'm doing my best to like keep it to a a size that I've planned for because um, uh, injuries and Valdez actually ended up growing like fifty percent or something uh, through stretch goals. Um, and also just not me not realizing how much space things take up in a book. Uh, <laughs> turns out once you hit layout, things uh, uh, can be different than you expect. So I'm aiming for like 250 pages. Um, and my only real basis for how I get there is word count um, and how much space words typically take up in the books that I've made so far. Uh, so who knows? Could it be somewhere from like 230 to 300. Yeah, I'm aiming for digital release by December. 
um, so 2024, in case people are listening in the future. Um, and uh, and then physical release by like next uh, May. Um, I'm giving myself plenty of time. I always hope that I can deliver early, but then uh, delays happen and then we end up on schedule. So. Yeah. Some some of the people on the southern part of the country get getting like forty degree weather and complaining about how cold it is. Meanwhile, <laughs> we're like, really? Yeah. Well, it turns out when your uh, infrastructure isn't designed to handle cold, um, you have other problems. But yeah, it's usually usually delays end up being people getting sick. Um, I've had a lot of like layout delays because the layout artist got sick and it's like well yeah i mean i'm not gonna rush you because i hope you stay healthy so <laughs> you get hit because the idea of epic trainings i find interesting yes epic trainings are the next stretch goal uh, as we're talking um they'll probably get unlocked here in the next day or so i would guess um, those are going to be like advanced trainings, but targeted at much higher level characters. So um, I haven't figured out exactly what level I want them to be yet, but probably like, you know, 15th and higher. Um, so we're going to have some high level requirements for that. And they, I haven't decided if they're going to have, um, you know, class requirements the way that advanced trainings do, or if it's just going to be like, you know, powerful uh, features that sort of suit different play styles. I'm probably leaning more toward that, making them a little bit more class generic and and more archetype specific. Like, it, like I said, I do want to sincerely thank you for taking the time out of your schedule to come all the way to my temple and enjoy the madness that happens around here. And anytime you see fit to return, the door is always open. As I often say around here, drinking is not mandatory, but it is encouraged. Thanks for having me, and yeah, I'd be glad to be back sometime. And of course, a sincere thanks goes out... <clears throat> To everyone who took the time out of their schedule to come onto the show and enjoy the madness. And there will be plenty more where that came from, as there always is here, on the open bar of the internet. But until then, on behalf of the good brothers present and not present, my name is Mildra, I am your gaming monk, stay fucking frosty everybody!